Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Many of you know who I am. I'm John Devon, one of the volunteers here at the Homestead. And this is a pleasant surprise, not a surprise, but it's something that's been building over the past few months is the, the size of the crowds are getting bigger. And as Dan mentioned, we hope that we can uh, expand on the site, uh, perhaps getting a grant from the state. So if you know somebody in state government, uh, <laughs> the uh, park district is going to be writing a grant to try to get, uh, get us some, let us do some work, get more space. We have various ideas in the works and uh, uh, stand by and you'll hear more about that. So uh, some of you had, a, I think Jim Hope back here, who's been a speaker, said that the travel coming up from Montpelier was a little rough today. Um, Michael came from Binghamton, New York, right? Five, what time did you leave? Uh, uh, about seven. About seven this morning to get here. So bless him for coming and do this today, right? So let me give you a little uh, bio on Michael. Michael is currently a grant writer at Binghamton University, uh, Division of Research. He has an interest in archaeology of conflict and in cultural landscapes. He received his undergraduate degree from Fort Lewis College and his master's and doctorate in anthropology from Binghamton University. Until recently, he worked as a historic archaeologist uh, for the public archaeology facility at Binghamton University on historic sites ranging from industrial mills to farm stands. So somebody says, what do archaeologists do? It looks like they do just about everything. <laughs> His research in the Revolutionary War battlefields in upstate New York, uh, where he has applied uh, geographic information systems, GIS systems, to better identify the cultural resources related to the Revolutionary War battlefields. Most of us have been through Fort Anne, but uh, New York, but we probably know very little about what happened at uh, that location. So we're pleased to have Michael with us today. Oh. All right, can everybody hear me? Just doing a sub check. Okay. I want to thank John for the invitation um, and for everybody coming out on this really cold, I guess, regular fall day. <laughs> and it's nice to be coming from New York, uh, an invitation to Vermont, I guess, getting over the old feeling, hard feelings from a long, long time ago. <laughs> so we'll get a little bit of history from that time period with the Battle of Fort Anne. Um, I, I used to work for the Public Archaeology Facility. I'm still connected to them somewhat, uh, but the Public Archaeology Facility is what's called a cultural resource management firm, and we do kind of archaeology on a contract basis or by con or grants. Um, and usually, like if the Department of Transportation wants to build a new road or uh, build a new bridge, they'll have archaeologists come in ahead of time, make sure there isn't a site that could be destroyed, and if there is, try to mitigate whatever damage could happen. Um, so yeah, that's how we get to cover a lot of things. I usually sp I specialized in what's called uh, the historic period. So basically, that's kind of the time period where. Uh, there was a, a written documentary evidence or historical record. Uh, before that, we call that either prehistoric or pre-contact, kind of before the Europeans came to the North America. Uh, but we were called in by uh, the American Legion uh, Raymond Harvey Post in Fort Ann. Uh, they had re received a grant from the National Park Service American Battlefield Protection Program uh, to look at the Battle of Fort Ann. Uh, not a lot of people had looked at it. Uh, it kind of it's dropped out of the main narrative about the Saratoga campaign and the local community, some of them are, came today, uh, recognized that it had a valuable history and it was significant to the nation's history and they wanted some recognition for it. And they, that fit right into the National Park Service's American Battlefield Protection Program. It's a program that fits in with the overall National Park Service, but kind of does its own thing. And it's an outgrowth from the 90s um, when, if anybody remembers, Disneyland bought property outside of the Bull Run Battlefield, and they were gonna turn that into a theme park. And <laughs> so, yes, yeah, I think people kind of had those fears that of like Confederate Donald or Union Goofy, so 
Uh, people, the public stepped in and asked Congress to do something about it. Um, Congress went in and bought a big parcel so that Disney couldn't do that, and they preserved Battle of Bull Run, or at least parts of it. Uh, but then Congress said, we can't do this for every battlefield. We need to figure out how this is going to last, how can we preserve this in the long run? So they set up the American Battlefield Protection Program. And so their goal ultimately is to protect America's battlefields. Um, and it cites with a, kind of the armed conflicts that influenced our nation's history. Um, this can be before the, the U.S. started, before the Revolutionary Wars. Uh, they do stuff with the Pequot War. Uh, even they do stuff with the Indian Wars out west all the way through uh, kind of the Battle of Midway in World War II. It's just any place that Americans were in conflict or even before America that's on American territory. Um, they also realized that the best way for preservation is from the local community up. They realize they're based in Washington, D.C., but if they, they realize if they come out to a community and say, you need to preserve this, it's probably not going to work. They realize they want a, the local community to come together, see the significance in the history of their community, and actively plan to preserve these battlefields. Um, that, and part of that is just to raise awareness. So activities like this, public talks, uh, presentations. I don't know if you saw that uh, PBS documentary that was out of C central New York. Um, I don't know. It, it was kind of based out of the Syracuse PBS, but that was funded by the American Battlefield Protection Program. Just kind of programs to get people to realize these battlefields are still here. They're important. And with people, hopefully when people realize the significance of these battlefields, they'll want to save them. Um, because we were tied with a National Park Service grant, um, we follow kind of their setup of how we do preservation, which is pretty much standard for a lot of archaeology. And I think a lot of people here have probably been to a historic lecture. And so this is more of an archaeology one, so it's a little bit different. Um, but a lot of our goals is to kind of not just tell, tell this historical story, but also the, get to the material aspects of what happened at that battlefield or that landscape, and then also how we, can we preserve that. Uh, I would say the historians always give up right when it's getting interesting and fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our first step is we have to locate the battlefield. Um, some battlefields are famous, like Gettysburg, everyone has a really good idea where Gettysburg is. Um, but some smaller battlefields, some skirmishes, people might have some oral traditions or folklore of where it may have been, but we need to go out and actually pinpoint where it was exactly. Um, we have to, once we find kind of the general area of the battlefield, we have to find the landmarks that are tied to that battle. Um, if there was a ridge, was that ridge used in the battle? Or maybe people avoided it. Uh, we also, landmarks don't have to be natural landscape features, they can be cultural. So if you have a building, like uh, down in New York, there's an old stone fort kind of near between Cooperstown and Albany. And uh, it's in the Schoharie Valley, that there was a church and it still has a cannon ball hole in it still to this day from when uh, one of the Loyalist Johnsons did a raid through that area. Um, so right there, that's a landscape feature, even though it's a structure. Um, and also, because these battles, especially the Revolutionary War, uh, Fort Ann is just celebrated its 240th anniversary. So that means there's been 240 years where people have used that land between the battle and today. There's obviously going to be some changes to landscape, so we have to kind of step in and see what's left and what can be saved. Um, and after we've realized what's still left of the battlefield, what can be saved, uh, help communities kind of decide what plans they can do to help preserve that landscape. Um, so our specific goals for the Fort Ann project, uh, kind of just do an inventory of archives related to the battlefield of Fort Ann. There's, because the battle of Fort Ann is kind of fell to the wayside, on a lot of people's narratives about the Saratoga campaign, um, usually in the big books or the secondary histories of Saratoga, it's 
like just a couple sentences, like, oh yeah, something happened at Fort Ann. Um, so we had to go through and find out what were records out there, what, that people write in their journals or diaries about the battle, and where were these located, uh, what archives. Um, and then from that, kind of associate from the documents to the real, what's left in the world right now. Um, what were the landscape features that people used during the battle that we could pinpoint today? Um, and from that information, identify the boundaries of Fort Ann because one of the goals was, or one of, Fort Ann was under threat because there was, uh, the landowner wanted to mine it for top, topsoil and for granite. And so we had to pinpoint where the boundaries of the battlefield were to see if it was really on his property and also show that the battle was significant. Um, if it was kind of an unimportant battle and it wasn't really on his property, then it probably would have been more open to be developed. Um, so basically our ultimate goals were to show the significance of Fort Ann and also define the boundaries of the battlefield. And, us, and the current condition. What, was there anything left of the battlefield to save? Um, so there's a sign of, for Fort Ann, if you go in through Fort Ann right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, our, kind of our big project was to, because it was under threat uh, with the landowner, to see if it was a battlefield, was it there or was it not? Um, and also if there was anything left to preserve. Um, so kind of more of the history of Fort Ann. Fort Ann is in a place that historically is in kind of a crossroads of trade, but also conflict. It's right at the boundary between the Champlain Valley and the Hudson Valley. Um, so there's kind of two ways, main ways you could go. You could go down Lake George, which is a nice watery pathway to go. Um, or you could do more of a land route that also has some streams like Wood Creek that goes from South Bay of Lake Champlain and crosses over there. Um, but because it was at a crossroads, uh, the British liked to always keep some sort of fort fortification there to see who was crossing between the Champlain Valley and the Hudson Valley. Uh, because up north, where they're enduring enemies, the French, and down in Albany were the British. So the first fort, fortification at Fort Anne is in 1692 by uh, Connecticut's colonial governor, uh, Fitz John Winthrop. Um, he built it during his invasion or attempted invasion of Montreal. Um, he set up a fortification there. Fortifications were served both mainly two purposes. One for observation, kind of seeing who's going in areas. And with that, you could help defend an area uh, you could know where to send people. So if peop the French were coming down this way, you could send troops up there to stop them. Um, you're also set up to su supply. So if you're sending troops or people up through this area, f the fortification system is basically designed so there's a fort about a day's journey from each other. So it would only take you about a day to get from one fort to the other. Um, that way too, if you get if you're low on supplies and you had to stop here, you could be easily ambushed. But if it's a day away, you could usually make that and you'd be safe. Uh, so that's why there's a lot of series of forts in this area. Uh, and then 1709, the British built a second fort a little off to the side of the original fort. Um, that gets quickly abandoned after an epidemic. Um, but then there was a Queen Ant where it gets its name because it was funded by Queen Anne of England. In 1711, they build a new fort to replace the diseased fort. Um, and then it goes into disuse. There's kind of a hiatus in the conflict between the French and the British uh, up until the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War. And then 1757, the British reoccupy Fort Anne. Um, they also built Fort George. Uh, but Fort George, if you go there, it's on the south base of Lake George there. There's only one bastion built uh, because the British, they were gonna attack Fort Carrion, which now is later on Fort Ticonderoga, and they thought it was gonna be kind of a long campaign to take down the French, uh, but the French 
uh, actually uh, kind of fell pretty easily, so they didn't have time to finish building Fort George. So that's why there's only one bastion constructed there. Um, and then after the British win the Seven Years' War, they don't need this because they also own Canada. They don't really need these forts right here, so they abandon them. They're not used and they fall apart, decay. Uh, but then with the start of the uh, American Revolution, the Americans and the Continentals start occupying these old forts. Uh, so they, they set up a small fortification at Fort George. Um, they, 1775, they capture, with Ethan Allen's help, Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, they set up something at Crown Point, or they at least take it over with Colonel Seth Warner at the same time as they capture Fort Ticonderoga. And they also set up the fort at Fort Anne. Uh, fort Anne was a kind of a, more of an outpost. It housed about 30 troops. Um, but it was more just used to help supply troops as they went up through this area, and also as a, way, as a waypoint as they either went from New England and up to Fort Ticonderoga or down to Fort Edward, um, but also just to keep watch of who's coming down between the Champlain Valley and the Hudson Valley. So, well, I kind of go back. So about, it also, because it was a way station, it helped on the Continentals attack when they went up to Canada and took over, captured Montreal, and they tried to capture Quebec City. It didn't work out so well for them. Um, and then in 1776, they get pushed back by the British, and that culminates in the uh, Battle of Valcour Island, which they lose, Benedict Arnold, which kind of has, they say is the start of the U.S. Navy out of White, what is now Whitehall, but it's Skeensboro at the time. Um, and that could have been a time where it was the British troops at the, that campaign were led by Sir Guy Carleton out of Canada. And he, right after Valcour Island, he figures, well, it's getting really late in the season. We don't have enough time to push against, further against the Continentals. So he stops his advance and goes back to Canada. Um, one of his lower officers, uh, Lieutenant General John Burgoyne, was on that campaign and he gets really upset that Carleton abandons the campaign. Um, so he goes back to England that winter of 76 to 77 because his wife had died, and so he has to manage his estate. Um, while he's back in England, he comes up with an idea kind of to usurp against Guy Carleton's authority in Canada, um, and also to just kind of promote himself as a leader. Um, but his plan was basically to, he would lead a main army from Montreal down the Champlain Valley into the Hudson Valley, down to Albany. At the same time, a force under uh, Barry St. Ledger or Salinger uh, would go down the St. Lawrence River, Lake Ontario, and through the Mohawk Valley, down to Albany. Now, Kind of, some people say that he wanted General Howe out of New York City to meet him up in Albany, but he doesn't really detail how he wants to use Howe in that campaign. Nobody's talking to Howe at, the, at this time, so Howe already has his plans to go. He's so outside of this plan, he's not even on this map. <laughs> but his plan is to go around New Jersey, up the Delaware River, and capture Philadelphia. Um, but he's in New York City with these plans and nobody's talking to him. Uh, Burgoyne's in England talking to Lord George Germain and the King, and they all are really excited about his plan because, you see, if you capture Albany, you can kind of isolate New England from the rest of the colonies. And how England at this time sees that New England are the troublemakers, causing all the other colonies to get upset. So if you isolate New England, the rest of the colonies will fall in line and it hopefully it will end the war. Um, so, and even if Howe doesn't come up, they were hoping that General Clinton, Howe's uh, second officer, would come up through the Hudson Highland and help Burgoyne if needed. Um, and he has a really detailed plan about how he wants this to work. And one of the things that he notes is that it is natural likewise to expect that he, kind of Major General Philip Schuyler, who's head of the Continental Army's Northern Department, basically the 
head of the Continental Army for this region. So it's like it's natural likewise to expect that he, Schuyler, will take measures to block up the road for Ticonderoga to Albany by the way of Skeensboro, by fortifying the strong ground at different places and therefore obliged the King's Army to carry the weight of artillery with it and by falling trees, breaking bridges, and other impediments. So he basically he's saying in his strategy for all this, he's like, if I take a waterly route, I'll be okay. If I take more of a land-based route, the Continentals are gonna wreck the roads, they're gonna block my way for whatever creeks I can take. So it's better if I take a waterly route. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, so at first, he starts off and he has lots of momentum Burgoyne. Um, he takes Crown Point fairly easily on Lake Champlain because the Continentals didn't really have anybody at Crown Point. Um, he gets Fort Ticonderoga and he captures that fairly easily as well. Um, July 6, he takes over Skeensboro with minimal resistance, if any. Um, July 7, as many of you probably here know, the Battle of Hubbardton, and that he's fairly uh, successful at. And then here we have July 7th and 8th at Fort Anne, and that's kind of what Hubbardton, there's resistance, but Fort Anne too, he faces a lot of resistance as well. Um, but you can see the red is the path the British took, and the, the blue is the path the Continentals take, and so it doesn't look good for the Continentals, they're always going, falling back. <laughs> and it's kind of off this map is, we'll talk about it later, the main Continental Army after they abandon Fort Ticonderoga <coughs> goes out this way into present-day Vermont and comes back this way. And then there was a second route group out of Fort Ticonderoga, Colonel Pierce Long of the second New Hampshire, plus kind of a mixture of everybody else at Fort Ticonderoga that doesn't go with the main Continental Army that goes south to Skeensboro and ultimately Fort Anne. Uh, so a lot of this hinges on uh, Fort Ticonderoga here. And this is taken from Mount Defiance. And what happens is that Fort Ticonderoga is kind of a forgotten outpost by the Continental Congress. They don't really send up troops, a lot of troops. At the time of early summer 1777, there's about 2,000 Continental troops here. A lot of them are sick because of a measles epidemic. Um, it's not a great fortification for what the Continentals wanted to use it for because it was originally built by the French. It's set up to defend against invasions from the south and the Continentals are using it to defend against invasions from the north. So it's kind of the opposite direction of what it should be. Um, it also, because it had been abandoned after seven years war, it's basically falling apart, decay. Uh, Continental Congress isn't giving them enough resources or the army enough resources to build it up. So they really have to pick and choose what they want to use to defend the fort. Um, and at this time too, General Major General Arthur St. Clair or Sinclair shows up just a couple weeks before Burgoyne's army shows up. So he's just new to his outpost as well. Um, and he really has to prioritize once he, what he wants to defend. So he defends Mount Independence, which is off the photo that way. They uh, build some of the earthworks up out here. They put a giant boom to block any boats. But they leave Mount Defiance empty. And kind of the thought was, well, it's a really steep hill. Nobody's going to put any artillery up there. Um, but the British, when they first come down here, there's some resistance, but it falls back fairly easily. And they were able to put uh, ar artillery on Mount Defiance. And as you can see, you have a pretty clean shot for Mount Defiance from where this picture was taken right into Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, Sinclair realizes what's happening on the night, evening of July 5th, 1777, and he just orders the fort abandoned. Um, and that's where he splits up his two groups. The main Continental Army goes off over Mount Independence into Vermont and Hubbardton. Uh, the other one, Pierce Long, they all sneak out in the middle of the night along small bateau south on Lake Champlain towards Skeensboro. 
And here's Skeensboro today. That's kind of in South Bay Lake, or Lake Champlain. Um, before this, this is the area too where uh, Benedict Arnold built the U.S. Navy. Um, set it aloft on uh, Lake Champlain and then scuttled most of it at the Battle of Valcour Island. Um, but this battle, Skeensboro, the Continentals kind of rush through in the middle of the night from July 5th to July 6th and they r arrive in Skeensboro and they're loading, offloading the boats, getting people to safety and two hours after they land, Burgoyne's army's right behind them and arrives. Uh, so it was kind of a mad dash trying to escape the British and they just couldn't do it. Uh, Burgoyne's Navy basically bombards the Continental's boats. Um, the Continental's are also in such a panic, they scuttle a lot of their own ships. Um, Burgoyne was also able to offload some of his troops and they were outflanking the Continental's. So at that point, the Continental's think everything's lost. Uh, they've lost their material. Uh, there were so many supplies from the Continental ships floating in the bay that the British troops said they basically could just throw hooks out and drag in the supplies. Um, so they had barrels of pork and stuff that were the Continentals that are now Burgoyne's Arby's. Um, so they meet, the Continentals also meet up with a company of the 3rd New Hampshire under Captain James Gray who was positioned at Skeensboro. Um, but they quickly realize because they're going to be surrounded that they need to move on. Uh, so they move along Wood Creek uh, on their little bateau. Half the troops, like uh, Captain John or James Gray's soldiers, kind of follow a beat up road along Wood Creek. And the women and children that were from, and the six soldiers that were from Fort Ticonderoga, fall, fall behind on the boats um, on their way to Fort Ann. And because it's this audience, there's Hubberton. Um, which is also kind of where Simon Fraser of the British Army and uh, Raisadel, or I'm really mispronounced that, <laughs> uh, the Hessians follow the main line of the Continentals, catch up with the rear guard at Hubberton that are under the command of uh, Colonel Seth Warner. Uh, they were, the Continentals were able to kind of counterattack the British at some point, but ultimately have to fall back, and that's on July 7th. Um, at the same time, basically after, so at this point, the Continentals leaving from Fort Ticonderoga to Skeensboro, they leave in the middle of the night, July 5th. They arrive the early morning of July 6th at Skeensboro. They immediately have to retreat from there too, and they make the trek down to Fort Ann. They haven't had time to really stop at rest at all. So they arrive at Fort Ann the early evening out, early morning hours of July 7th. Uh, so Captain James Gray of the 3rd New Hampshire, who they picked up at uh, Skeensboro, he arrives at Fort Ann, which is right there, at basically six in the morning. Uh, quickly behind them along Wood Creek are the Burgoyne uh, sent, ordered the 9th Regiment of Foot to kind of pursue and track down the retreating Continentals. Uh, they were able to capture some of the bateau that had some of the women and six soldiers and take them prisoners. But when, so these troops really in the early hours from the Continentals arrive at Fort Anne and they notice that the British, the 9th Regiment of Foot, are, arrive shortly right after them. But they decide at Fort Anne that they're not going to retreat anymore. They're going to take a stand and push back against the British. So Captain James Gray arrives at the fort after marching all night at 6 a.m. July 7th and he immediately pushes back, at, leaves Fort Ann to attack at 11 a.m. So basically five hours of rest. Um, so they march up the Continentals with about 150 troops. Uh, there's about 190 to 200 troops with the 9th Regiment of Foot, the British. And the Continentals were able to quickly surround and push the British up on top of what's called Battle Hill today. And most of the fighting of Fort Anne is on Battle Hill. Uh, there's very little activity around Fort Anne, the fort itself. Um, so some of the 
But it's a quick day. They spend the entire day fighting each other over this hill, about six hours. And then finally the Continentals say, well, okay, we, it's getting dark, we've had enough. Let's go back to Fort Ann and rest. Um, so, so the casualties for the first day, the Continentals uh, had about one killed and three wounded. Um, and there were three British killed during the first day of Fort Ann. Uh, the second day, it gets more complicated. At this point, Philip Schuyler no has got received word that Fort Ticonderoga has fell, Skeensboro has fallen, uh, his army is about ready to collapse. So he sends the 6th Albany militia up to reinforce the troops at Fort Ann. And they're under uh, the command of Colonel Van Rensselaer. And they come up and helps, and they are about 400 troops with the militia. And that morning at the British camp, probably around here, and some camps probably too on top of the ridge still, uh, a deserter, supposed deserter, comes up to the British camp from the Continentals and says, oh, I'm deserting. And he asks how strong the British army is right there. He, they tell him, it's like, oh, we have a hun about 190 troops. He tells the British that there are about 1,000 American troops there. <laughs> and so now the, the British are panicking. They, they definitely can't take on 1,000 troops. And right after they sent up a request, a scout to go back to Burgoyne's main army to ask for reinforcements, the deserter disappeared. Um, so he's probably more of a spy than a deserter. <laughs> uh, Burgoyne. Try, he's still up at Skeensboro because he has his big flotilla of all his supplies. And he's trying to offload all his artillery and supplies from his boats onto land so he can make this trek down to Fort Ann. And so he's really held up. There's also a rainstorm holding his troops up, so he's unable to send reinforcements down to Fort Ann. Um, so the Continentals, Captain James Gray again comes out, leads the troops. Uh, up here after the British camp and the kind of the militia takes this circular way to kind of outflank the British too. And so the British are woken up in their camp with an early morning surprise attack. And the woods on Battle Hill are really thick. Um, the, Continental, the British have accounts that basically they, they can hear the Continentals around them. They know they're surrounded, but they can't see them. Um, so they have no choice but basically to retreat up back to Battle Hill and try to make a stand there. Um, so that the British are up on top of the ridge and they're kind of unable to really make a strong attack against the Continentals. The Continentals again are not really able to overcome the British position so they're kind of in a stalemate. They go for six hours and they f spend those six hours fighting at, shooting at each other constantly. Uh, one uh, British officer, Captain Money, who shows up later, said it was the heaviest firefighting he saw during the entire Saratoga campaign. Um, about the afternoon, the Continentals are running out of ammo, the British are running out of ammo, and that Captain Money, although Burgoyne wasn't able to send really supplies down or reinforcements, he was able to send Captain Money, which is kind of weird because Captain Money was his quartermaster. Uh, I'm not sure why you're trying to offload all your supplies. You send your quartermaster down to the front lines, but that's what we're going to do. And he had with him a, a large component of Native American allies. And so Mo Captain Money shows up out with his Native American warriors Outside, they hear the battle going on because it's a really ferocious firefight. The Native Americans do not want to be a part of this fight, so they leave. <laughs> and Captain Money's just there by himself. He doesn't know what to do. But he had apparently been trying to, his impersonation of an Indian war whoop. <laughs> and so he, call, he tries out his Indian war whoop, and the Continental Army, running low on ammo, think that it kind of a invading force of Native American warriors that are about to attack them or ambush them. They figure it's not worth it, so they leave the hill and come down back to Fort Ann. 
they have a council of war and realize, well, it's not really worth it. Let's, we've done what we needed to do. Because the, the militia, when they were sent up by Schuyler, Schuyler said, I don't care if you keep Fort Anne. It was more, he wanted this to be a holding action, to hold the British in place while he's taking supplies from all the other forts, like Fort George and kind of the other forts in the area and consolidating all his resources at Fort Edward. Because he knew the British were on their way, he couldn't stop them, but he needed to consolidate his resources and his <coughs> troops in one spot. Um, so he just wanted the militia with the Continentals at Fort Anne to hold them for 24 hours. They did that, and so the Continentals said, well, that's fine. We'll move on and abandon Fort Anne and make our way to Fort Edward. Um, part of that, there's Fort Anne here, kind of up around here. There's kind of a forest. Oops, wrong way. Oh, uh, the firefight, because it was so crazy, there's kind of a noted... Uh, a captain was shot, uh, Captain Montgomery of the British Army. He gets uh, shot kind of on his way trying to go up the hill, but he's mortally wounded. He's captured by the Continentals, but at this time they don't really have POWs. They basically get furloughed. And he gets furloughed in New York City because it's occupied by the British. And that's his grave site. He's buried in uh, Trinity Church the same location where Alexander Hamilton's buried and Horatio Gates, a lot of Continental heroes are. And I guess they gave him a nice American flag. <laughs> 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 and he was mortally wounded, but he died about a year. It took a year for his wounds to kill him. Um, also, uh, the Continentals were pushing the British back. They, over, they come across the, the women and the six soldiers that were taken prisoner on Wood Creek and so they freed them. That's one of the few cases in the Continental or the Revolutionary War where, that, where prisoners were rescued in the middle of a battle. Um, but also this is kind of a lithograph of kind of a sawmill. That's Fort Anne. It's kind of, they put a lot of things together that were spatially separated. Um, but Skeensboro is named after Philip Skeen, who was a big loyalist, and he had a sawmill here. It's, and he lost it when he left to lead kind of a, re a loyalist regiment for the British. Um, and the Continentals came in, take over, took over his sawmill, took over Fort Anne. When they abandoned Fort Anne, they ordered the burning of all these fortifications when they left. Um, I think they were successful at burning down the sawmill, but Fort Anne didn't catch on fire or something happened, so it wasn't actually burned down. So the British were able to come in. Um, so, but skiing, that's why it's called Whitehall today, because after the war, you couldn't, they didn't want to keep the town's name after a loyalist who actually fought against the Continental Army, so they changed it to Whitehall. That's why he's been forgotten in space. Um, so, it's, so kind of what's the outcome of the Battle of Fort Anne? Um, let's see, there were... The British suffered about 13 killed, 22 wounded. Uh, they had two of their people captured. One was that Captain Montgomery. They also had one of their surgeons were captured. Uh, the Continentals suffered about 15 uh, casualties and the second New Hampshire lost their colors, uh, which I think ultimately after the war were returned back to New Hampshire. And I think they're housed at the New Hampshire Historical Society. Um, but, so, I mean, it looks like it's a small skirmish, but it really changes the trajectory of Burgoyne's campaign. If, because it took this land route, I'll go back. He did send some of his troops over Lake George, which is more of the waterly route that he said he wanted to do. But Fort Anne draws him along this land route, which if you recall in his plans, he said, well, if I do that, I'm going to be, my strategy is going to fail. Um, so he didn't take his own advice. <laughs> and so what happens is after Fort Sk or Schuyler comes, he consolidates all his troops and forces at Fort Edward, and he calls up the militia. And what do they do? They do what Burgoyne said he would do. They tear up the roads in this whole area. 
They cut down trees and logs and fill up the creeks to obstruct them. And so that just immediately slows down Burgoyne. So here he goes from Ju late June, and then July 5th and 6th, and he's like boom, 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 going real fast. He gets to Fort Anne and he just stops for a while. Um, he also gets, he, he sets up his headquarters at Fort Anne around July 22nd. Uh, he ultimately leaves Fort Ann as a headquarters around July 28th and makes his way down to Fort Edward and slowly down towards Saratoga. Um, he does leave a small uh, kind of core of troops at Fort Ann, but in September the Continentals are able to take it back. Um, kind of another key point at what his time at Fort Ann is the Jane McRae massacre happens. And Jane McRae was uh, from Fort Edward, and she was going up to meet her loyalist fiance, who was stationed at Fort Anne when she was killed. Um, and that kind of gets the loyalists to not want to side with uh, Burgoyne's army. And Burgoyne was really reliant on loyalist support. He was told that he was going to be welcomed with open arms by the loyalists that were in hiding in the Hudson Valley, that they would come out to support him. Um, a lot of this was told by the Johnson family out of the Mohawk Valley, who took the same ship over to England to meet with Burgoyne that winter where he came up with a strategy. I think it's the same ship that Ethan Allen sailed over on his uh, prisoner when he was taken prisoner to England. Um, so it's a small world. Um, but the Loyalists, especially because of the Jane McRae, they, the Loyalists thought, well, if they'll kill her, they'll kill any of us. There's no support or loyalty to there. So they didn't come out to support Burgoyne. Also, Burgoyne had a lot of Native Americans, warriors, allies to support him. Um, but because of Jane McRae, he kind of lectures the Native Americans and tells them they can't fight the way they're doing their traditional fighting. Um, so they get really upset with that. They also get really upset with his slow progress. Uh, the Native Americans during the war, they did not like siege tactics. They liked more just action, ambush fighting, and then his low, get, getting lectured by Burgoyne and the British officers, and then also ta having, taking a long time to get to where they were going. A lot of his Native American troops abandoned him during his campaign. And so by the time he gets down to Saratoga, he's taken so long, he's out of troops, he's not getting local support, He's run out of a lot of resources. He has a really long supply chain reaching from these lower forts all the way up through the Hudson Valley, Lake Champlain, up to Canada. Um, and then the Continentals are raiding his supply lines behind him. And so that's why he goes to Bennington to try to get more supplies. That fails. And ultimately in September, October, at Battles of Saratoga, he ultimately has to surrender um, so a lot of that kind of could all be traced back to what happens at Fort Anne um, by pushing him on a route that even admitted in his plan would be a failed route. Um, so it showed the significance of Fort Anne. So we need to show kind of what's left of the, the landscape at Fort Anne. Um, so we went through historic documents. We looked through journals, letters. Um, historic maps such as this one. This one you can see there's Skeensboro and Fort Ann down there. This is just more of a property parcel map. Um, we also did a walkover and an archaeological excavation. Uh, we also did a lot of spatial analysis, so geographic information system or GIS, uh, where we did view sheds and slope analysis and then range of fire, which I'll get into. But this all feeds into what we call a form of military terrain analysis, so we call it KAKOA. Has anybody here been in the military? It's based off of what they've, they train. Uh, it's it from the Army Manual for military terrain analysis. They use a different order for the word, so it's a different acronym. I think it's ACOA, something like that, but it's basically, so we go through the historic records, uh, either historic documents like maps, journals, diaries, letters, to see how people are describing landscape features. And then we categorize it into either uh, key, key terrain, uh, those pr parts of the landscape that were either a strategic or tactical object objective, 
So Battle Hill at Fort Ann, that's key terrain. People, the Continentals were trying to take it, and the British were trying to defend it. Uh, and then we have O for observation or field of fire, and those are areas that are open to observation from a point or areas that are under fire. So if you're within an area that could be reached by a musket or a rifle, that's within the field of fire. Uh, we also do cover concealment. Uh, so landscape features that hide troops from observation or fire. So the woods and the trees that were on Battle Hill, and so the British couldn't see the Continentals, that's considered cover concealment. Um, obstacles, uh, landscape features that limit movement. Uh, so parts of Battle Hill, because of the terrain is so steep, that could be considered an obstacle. Wood Creek, the difficulty of crossing the creek, that could be an obstacle. And then we also look at avenues of approach and retreat. What were the paths and trails that the Continentals or the British used to get to the battlefield and what did they use to get away? Um, so a lot of, traditionally people looked at mostly these upper ones for battlefields. Where are people shooting at each other? And where this approach kind of expands that to kind of secondary landscape features like avenues of approach and retreat. What areas maybe not have had direct fighting, uh, but were actually pivotal or influential for the battle. Uh, so how do we do that? Just a quick example. This is a text from uh, Colonel Van Rensselaer's widow. She, her husband was uh, injured during Fort Ann. He was shot in the gut, and he actually commanded his troops from behind a log while he was, after he was shot. <laughs> um, but he had died and she was applying for a pension. And so she, as part of a pension, you had to show, explain where you or your relative fought in the war, list what campaigns or battles they were in. And sometimes these pensions are very detailed as this one has it. So what we're looking for is in the red. So like a defile or pass past Fort Ann formed by a ledge of rocks on his left. So that gives us direction and then Wood Creek with a thick swamp on his right, and then a distance upward of 20 miles. So right there we have distance of how long you took to get someplace, uh, the descriptions of the terrain of like rocks and Wood Creek and swamps. Um, so this gives us a really good description of what the landscape and terrain was like during the battle and kind of the mo his movements during the battle through this landscape. Um, here's from a British officer uh, Major Gordon Forbes of the 9th Regiment. And again, so kind of direction, so front, and large body past the creek on the left. And we have to do some kind of tweaking because not everybody's saying, gonna say like Wood Creek. Some might just say Creek. Some might say Wood Creek. So you kind of have to standardize the descriptions. And then a thick wood across the creek on the left flank of the regiments. So again, it gives you direction from where he's standing to where uh, the attack or movement's happening. And then where, he, where they retreated to. So we took post on top of the high hill to our right. So that kind of gives you a direction of where they retreated up to on Battle Hill. So we take that information, put it in a database, tie it into a uh, geographic information system. But Fort Ann was difficult um, because we also want to find out who is actually at Fort Ann because that can tell us where to look for if there was an officer or a soldier to see if they wrote a diary or a letter or a journal. Uh, Captain James Gray wrote, wrote a lot. He wrote le letters. He also did a day-by-day -day synopsis of what happened every day on the back of his muster roll for his company. Um, and that's the front of it. Uh, and so we could also use the muster roll to figure out counts of who was there. Because Fort Ann was such a chaotic retreat, you have a mixed group of troops from Fort Ticonderoga that get merged with the troops from Skeensboro, who also get merged with the 15th Massachusetts who are stationed at Fort Ann. So it's really difficult to figure out who was there, so we have to go. This is a, what we put together. Uh, the British are pretty easy. They're all the 9th Regiment afoot under Colonel Hill, about 190 soldiers. The first day, we have the 2nd New Hampshire uh, with about 600 troops and then 150 soldiers that are injured from Fort Ticonderoga um, and also other mixed regiments. We have James Gray's 3rd Regiment, 
from New Hampshire with about 50, the 15th Massachusetts with about 44 troops, and then uh, the 6th doesn't really show up till the 8th, but they bring up another 400 soldiers. So from there we can kind of get a total number of troops for each side. And you can see with the Continental side it's very mixed. There's not kind of one central military unit there. We also used uh, historic maps, which were very useful. Uh, so we have the 1777 campaign map, which shows generally what like the larger topographic features are, where generally where the forts were and the rivers. And we can match that up. So this one's like from the mid 1800s, and you can see already they've called that Battle Hill. Um, what we do with we can input these maps in GIS. We actually can tie them into modern day maps and sh stretch and shrink the, these historic maps to fit and overlay the current maps. So that can help us find where things actually align from the historic maps to today. And then we have topographic maps from the USGS. And 1904, for some reason, they moved Battle Hill, from, which is there, down to there. <laughs> that confuses a lot of people. Uh, but then in 46, Battle Hill moves back up to the other side of the creek. <laughs> and so you can also see, use these maps to see what, because we're also looking for what changes that happened after the battle. And so you can see the Champlain Canal kind of cuts into Wood Creek there. Uh, there's a railroad that goes there that cuts into things. Um, we get in the 40s, Fort Ann's built up a lot. There's a new road that goes there too, along with the railroad. So there's a lot of transportation routes because just as in the 1700s, it was a good transportation crossing. Even today, it's a good transportation crossing. Um, so we did a walkover. So kind of just get an idea of the visually what's there. That's Battle Hill from the base of it. Uh, this is all wetlands and swamp down here. Um, so this is kind of on top. It's very wooded even today. It's all secondary tertiary forests because uh, it was after the battle. Battle Hill wasn't really used. It's so steep it's not very good for fit farming, but it was used for logging. Um, this is on top of the ridge. It's kind of an area where the British troops probably positioned themselves after they retreated from the base up to the top to get away from the Continentals. Um, this is kind of shows the steepness of parts of Battle Hill. So this is up around there would be where the British were retreated to, and this is basically kind of generally where the Continentals were standing. Uh, this, again, another piece, example of the steepness. It's a very steep hill. <laughs> um, this is taken from uh, on top of it, looking out towards the village of Fort Anne. And again, you can see just how rocky and steep that hill is. And again, there's Wood Creek right there, the, now the Champlain Canal. Uh, village of Fort Anne's about there. So you can see from the village of Fort Anne, you can see Battle Hill. And this is, again, kind of a, from a continental position looking at where the British were up there. And just again, how much, this was in the early spring where there wasn't a lot of undergrowth. <laughs> it's a lot thicker with the undergrowth and trees during the summer months. And I get kind of an overall view, just how rocky and steep again. So some of the artifacts we found, uh, we found quite a few musket balls. Uh, one thing that was interesting, we've, with the British troops, uh, based on an account from one of the privates, um, the British troops apparently were getting lazy. They didn't want to use their ramrods to load the muskets. So instead they would just bash the butts of their muskets on the ground instead of using a ramrod. And the officers really did not like that because basically it doesn't do a really good load and it can lead to a lot of misfires. And if you're in the heat of battle, it's hard to hear if your gun's actually misfiring. So what you get a lot of times is soldiers just keep reloading and reloading even though they're doesn't, gun hasn't actually gone off. Um, so this is a fired bolt musket ball. Uh, musket balls are larger than rifle balls. Um, they're about kind of like six tenths of an 
eight, or about 70 tenths of an inch to about 0.75 inches in size for a musket. Rifle is more like 0.3 to 0.6. Uh, so rifle balls are quite a bit smaller. Uh, you can see there's another one here. You can kind of see an indentation for when someone was using a ramrod to load the musket and bat, kind of hit it down into the gun. Um, we, didn't, we found some buckshot, which uh, uh, General Washington preferred that the Continental's troops use buckshot with their musket balls. So they would have, how they would load it is one musket ball with like three to four buckshot, like little tiny BB. And that basically turns your musket into a shotgun. And, and here's another, oh, that's the same one. We also found one of these which somewhat is kind of a unique type of bullet where they found similar to these at uh, Monmouth Battlefield. And th they say that basically the troops are hammering or flattening out the musket ball and it turns it into like a dum-dum bullet. And it's uh, their interpretation at Monmouth, which could be the case here, is that snipers were using it to really inflict a lot of damage on whoever they were firing at. Uh, we also found some personal items, so buckles, uh, buttons. This is a, a button from a 9th Regiment of Foot uniform. Uh, so we know the 9th Regiment was there. <laughs> uh, we also found this. This is a gun flint. And gun flints are pretty fragile because they're just stone, like lithic so it's like can easily fracture. So what they would do to protect it, and it's hard to see in this one, but this is a, this outer thing is a piece of lead. And lead's pretty soft. That's why with the musket balls, when they fire, they get all mushed up. And that's how I can tell if a musket ball is fired or not fired. So if it, sometimes soldiers would just drop musket balls and we can find those and they, you could tell they still have the seams from the molds and they're really nicely round. Uh, the ones that are fired are kind of mushed up and smashed. Um, but lead's pretty soft. And in this one, too, between the lead and the gun flint is a small piece of leather that was still intact. And that they put that in because it was soft. That's what's in the hammer of the musket. When it fires down, it doesn't break your gun flint. So that way you don't have to replace it. Um, and this one we found is pretty exciting. Is a rifle ball from that's embedded in a log during the battle. So this log is kind of it's rotting now, but that has been in that tree for the past 240 years. And you can see kind of the path it took to get into that log. There's kind of a, what it looks like the wood taken off. Now we could tell too. Us so besides we know pretty close exactly what day <laughs> it entered that tree, uh, probably July 8th. Um, it's also because we could probably just determine that it was militia that used it, because uh, British didn't really use rifles during the, the, the Revolutionary War. There were some, like Ferguson's rifles that used rifles, but mostly they relied on muskets. Uh, Continentals. Sometimes we have some rifle companies, but most of the ones from Fort Ticonderoga were using muskets or French, either Brown Bess style or French muskets. Um, so we kind of make a safe assumption that if we find a rifle ball, that it was probably fired by militia because militia people had to supply their own weapons. And so they would usually just bring the rifles that they had at home anyway. Uh, so kind of getting into some GIS spatial analysis stuff. <laughs> this is a view shed analysis. So it's hard to see, but there's Fort Ann there. So this kind of does an analysis based on a uh, digital elevation model. Uh, so if you're standing at Fort Ann, everything in this green, you could see. Uh, all the stuff in pink, you can't see. So it kind of the computer goes through. So if there's like a, a hill in your way, it realizes you can't see through hills, so it'll turn that into the pink so that showing that you can't see it. So Fort Ann, they had a pretty good view of kind of at least the south side of Battle Hill. And so again, you could, the fort was to see who was coming in through this pass along Wood Creek. And so they get a good idea of who's coming in and out there. 
Uh, if you're in the British position after they retreated up on top of Fort <coughs> Battle Hill, that's what their little red dots are, hypothetical British positions. Um, that's what they could see. They could see way out in the valley, but not down in here where the Continentals were standing. Um, so these red dots are kind of hypothetical co continental positions. So from these red dots, they could see pretty much the base or the sides of Battle Hill, but they couldn't see really the top where the British were. Uh, so you can see why there was such a standoff or a stalemate. Neither side could really hit each other or see each other, which feeds into kind of we did a range of fire analysis, which basically like the view shed, but it kind of does it with different arm types. So this is based on muskets. And muskets were very inaccurate. They could only reach basically 50 yards for accuracy. Um, so again, for hypothetical British positions along the top, what could they reach? And just in the pink, they couldn't really reach much downslope below them. And this is from the continental positions. What they could hit with uh, a musket, and again, they could hit the sides, but not the tops where the British were. So again, there's kind of that's why these battle battle took so long without a lot of casualties, even though they were firing a lot. They just couldn't reach each other either side. Now, because the militia had rifles, we did rifles. Rifles could get up accuracy up to like 300 yards. They're a lot more accurate over longer distances. Um, again, they could get further distance, but still not on top the ridge where the British were. So we also go and look, after we have a good idea where p people were, uh, did some archaeology to figure out, uh, find evidence of where people were firing from or were firing to, uh, we got to just do see what happened to this landscape between the Revolutionary War and today. Um, here's a drawing or a lithograph of the village of Fort Ann, uh, kind of the early 1800s. Already it's kind of some farms are developing and evidence of the forts disappearing. Um, here's like an aerial photo from the 30s. Shows kind of there's that canal that went and straightened out Wood Creek. So that did a lot of damage just along the path of the creek. Uh, there's a railroad and road that goes that way. And if we do an aerial of today, the most of the landscape hasn't really changed from the 30s to today. The biggest change is kind of an updating of the road that New York or US 4 that goes through Fort Ann right now is they kind of chopped the path for that. That's the biggest change. Where is that sharp right turn you make to get onto that um, toward the end where you get onto Route 4 there? Uh, I think that's, that's down here. That's the village of Fort Ann. And you that's. Have to sort of go straight instead of turning right to see Battle Hill. Huh? Yeah, so if you're on US 4 going out of Fort Ann, it's right in front of you. That's Battle Hill right there. And actually, you're on the side of. I wouldn't recommend getting out because it's very dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a plaque. Cause the road they carved right into Battle Hill. And so there's oh, a okay. steep kind of rock wall right on the side of US 4. And there's a plaque commemorating Battle Hill. And I think some of your volunteers bravely put flags to mark it. But yeah, it's, if you stand there, you're probably going to get hit by a car or a truck or something. So I wouldn't do it. Uh, this is a map of the canal, uh, the construction map showing how they straightened Wood Creek for the canal. Um, so you can see Wood Creek is generally a meandering creek. Uh, but canals don't do well with meanders, so they straighten out like here or just make a more a straighter path. Again, they're kind of just chopping out those oxbows. And again, and it reaches all the way down to Fort Village of Fort Ann. And this is what it looks like after they cut to straighten it out, like, like a big cut rock face. Um, there's also other interesting things. Uh, a Revolutionary War veteran who, I don't think he fought at Fort Ann, but he fought at other battles. He kind of, after the war, lived in Fort Ann, and then uh, when he died, he had himself buried within the boundaries of the battlefield. Um, so it is uh, part of the battlefield now, uh, kind of a post-battle 
feature. Um, there's also some, like this rock wall, it actually marks a property line for on the hill, on Battle Hill. Um, but besides that, there's not a lot of historic evidence of use for the battle. There, there's the railroad that cuts into along Wood Creek and the canal. So you can see railroads do a lot of impact. Uh, that's what Fort Ann looks like today. <laughs> and it's accurate even with the ATM machine. <laughs> So, yeah, that's a total reconstruction. Um, probably not really reflective of the original one. Is it on the same site? Pretty close, yeah. I mean, I think the fort's probably been pretty uh, impact a lot, so it'd be hard to find evidence of the f actual fort. But the large fort took a big swing. I mean, is that the same size, the same dimensions? Pretty close, yeah. I mean, it wasn't large. It, it was probably meant to house about 30 troops when it was in regular use. During the battle, because you had all those people from Fort Ticonderoga and stuff, you had close to a thousand troops probably camping outside of it more than in the fort. And then this is uh, kind of a mid, early mid 20th century landfill, which is common with a lot of rural areas where people, there weren't kind of centralized dumps. So people made their own. Um, so there's like uh, bed springs here and old enamelware and tin cans scattered throughout. Uh, so there could still be battlefield stuff below that, but it, we use a lot of metal detecting for battlefield research. And this metal kind of masks any battlefield remains. Okay. Um, kind of what impact there was on Fort Ann was kind of logging roads. So you can see this is kind of a cut in logging road. Um, because it was uh, possibly going to be used as a granite mine. There's a kind of a test hole or kind of cut in every once in a while. Uh, but we use this information of what's left, where we found the archaeology, so we can kind of update the boundaries. And so that's kind of generally what they have. It's a long battle starting from Skeensboro. So that's that avenue of retreat approach as they go from Skeensboro down Wood Creek to Fort Ann, Battle, battle Hill. And then there's the subsequent retreat down to Fort Edward. So realize you probably can't preserve all of it. Um, a lot of this stuff's already impacted because it's either like US 4s, a lot of that. And there's another road down there. Um, so that's already kind of taken out. Um, but there's still local stuff you can keep preserved. And actually, the landowner, um, after discussions of seeing the significance of the battlefield of Fort Ann, and um, he actually uh, sold his property and donated a lot of it uh, to the Civil War Trust and the town of Fort Ann. And I think the long-term plans is to turn it into a park. Uh, so that's a kind of a happy ending as far as preservation. And there's a closer boundary of like Battle Hill and kind of a more, what's called a potential, a partner area, but basically what could be put on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, there's kind of more of an updated map and tipped at 3D. <laughs> so again, here's from Fort Ann crossing over these flats and wetlands and growing up the hill. And again, showing just how steep it is. <laughs> and just another view. Um, so this took a lot of effort, not just with PAF, we just more did a service part of it. Uh, the, the local preservation community of Fort Ann, the historic uh, society there, uh, the local American Legion posts, they've been dedicated for the last long years trying to get this site preserved. Um, also the National Park Service, the American Battlefield Program for providing funding for the project. Uh, this National uh, Saratoga, New York State Archives, the Public Library and Massachusetts Historical Society were all uh, great sources for archival materials. So I just want to thank them as well and thank you for braving the cold today. When did they reconstruct it? I mean, you know, the way we see it today. I think the 70s maybe. You guys might have a better idea. I think it's pretty recent. Could you repeat the question? Oh, get, uh, when was the reconstruction for Fort Ann built? Which it's just a bank, so it's not kind of a, it's a privately one. You think it was like. 
Okay, so yeah, 1975. Yep. Right outside the town, headed toward Lake George, there's a little ordinance house that passed by that's got a plaque on it. It's a revolutionary war. What's the significance of that? Um, there's like uh, like an ordinance building outside of Fort Ann on the way. Um, I'm not too specific. There's kind of a lot of different out houses. Not, that's a bad word, but outbuildings <laughs> related to Fort Ann. Um, so like there's the sawmill and different a aspects that were kind of tied to the general landscape of the battle, but weren't actually directly impacted by the battle. Um, so I think it's just one of those uh, outbuildings. For those of those who traveled mm -hmm. to the New York State Jewelry 30 <laughs> years, I was looking at this thing and wondering yeah. what it Yeah, because uh, Skeen's, like Skeen's Falls is kind of off to the side, but that we didn't find any evidence of the troops really crossing in during that battle. Uh, they tried, they burned it after they, the Continentals burned it after they left the battlefield in Fort Ann, but there's kind of no direct fighting at that site. As I'm interested in those uh, those musket balls that you showed slides of. Did you have to dig down deep to find those, or were they just laying on the surface? Um, not too deep, just because it's not a lot of uh, not a lot of soil development. Because it's more like on uplands and hills, so yeah, they're pretty not too deep. And and that um, I, was it like a rifle bullet that you found in that piece of wood? Mm -hmm. Are you sure that that's from the battle? Is there any chance it could have been from like a hunter from you know afterwards? <laughs> no, I mean they're they're different. You can usually like especially if it's more modern, you can usually tell the difference just because they change. Um, but no, I, I think we're fairly confident that it's for the battle. Yeah. Cool. What was the area of, uh, of the, the battlefield in preserve? Uh, mostly. Uh, I mean, in, in uh, geographical house, um, was it an acre or five acres? Or? I think it's close to 50 acres. 50 acres. Yeah. And then, why is the Civil War truck? Why is it well, um, well, they started, they're tied with. They're kind of a private foundation that works hand in hand with the American Battlefield Protection Program uh, to preserve battlefields. And when they first started their funding for grants, because the Battlefield Protection Program, they do like archeological and historic research grants, but they also do uh, like real estate grants for either land acquisition or easements. But up until recently, they only could do that, they only had the authority to do that for Civil War battlefields. Right. Uh, a couple of years ago, they cha they updated the law to also apply it to Rev War and War of 1812 battlefields. Okay. So when they first start, the Civil War Trust first started, since they could only preserve Civil War battlefields, that's where they get their name. And I think I think they've been talking about maybe updating the name. They do have a sub program within the Civil War Trust called Campaign 1776, and that deals specifically with the. Uh, campaign 1776. And they've that campaign 1776 uh, deals with preserving Revolutionary War and War of 1812 battles. Yes, I've wondered, I come up to Vermont, um, I was, I'm a Burlingtonian, but I'm not living here now, so I come up a couple of times a year, two or three, and I go through Fort Anne, and I'm always mystified, even in your discussion here, you use two spellings of Anne, A-N-N-E and A-N-N, can you explain that yeah. to me? Uh, yeah, it's, even during the Revolutionary War, they would do the spelling, I mean, because spelling during the Revolutionary War, is, there was no real standard spelling, so... Some people <laughs> spell things <laughs> one things one way, but uh, kind of for the revolutionary or up until the end of the revolution, Fort Anne with an E is considered the official spelling, and then I think eighteen oh seven the village and the town dropped the E, and so then so that's kind of it kind of it becomes a time marker as well. Although if you read like accounts during the battle, people are. Including the E or not including the E. And that was named after the Queen of England or the yeah the Queen of England. Yeah, Queen Queen Anne. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Just 
quickly when the when that woman was killed that was the fiance of the of the Tory. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand. Was it the did the was it the British that kill her? Do they feel that the Indians that are alive with them kill her? How, who's killing oh, it's, her? Oh, it's uh yeah Jane McRae. She was uh, her fiance was a loyalist and she was going up to meet him and while she and a kind of acquaintance were making the trek up there they get captured by two British allied Native Americans who I guess I mean it's the story now has become more myth and it's hard to get the truth but um, there's like a fight between the two of them who's gonna get credit for capturing them so they end up killing both Jane McRae and her friend and it becomes a big um, the the Continentals use it to rally against Burgoyne's invasion. As if he killed her. Yeah, so it's basically more like the British are, look what the British are doing. They're bringing these Native Americans to kill us. We need to stop them. All the way out to uh, the Mohawk Valley where uh, General Herkimer of uh, the Tryon County militia is using it to rally the militia troops. It's like, hey, they killed this woman we need to protect our people and that's why we need to stand and fight and, and so it, it becomes kind of a propaganda thing too amongst the continentals and then the loyalists are like well she was tied to a loyalist and they killed her they could kill us too so they keep hidden instead of coming out to support for going i'm going to take one more question from the floor and then those of you who have other questions can stay and talk to the speaker afterwards and i think phyllis has a couple of announcements or a little something that I have to announce. So, one more question from the floor. Um, and hello to, my, to the Ethan Allen people who saw me when I was here. I have a, a few questions, but I'll try to make it really tight. Could you explain a little bit more the connection between the Fort Ann battle and then the Hubbardton battle, which led to Benny, the Battle of Bennington? And if it's true, from my research, it's true that they had to disobey Schuyler, who said, forget about it. And they said, I don't think so, because all the stores are in Bennington and we're going once them so we're going to defend Bennington and they not only defended it but they really you know slaughtered him so that's one number two um, when you say uh, Native Americans could you tell the tr tell us what tribes because they're that's pretty important I think yeah. the Stockbridge Indians fought with the um, with the uh, Green Mountain Boys in Bennington and so anyway thank, thank you yeah, sure. Um, the Native Americans, it's, it was hard to identify which tribes were allied with them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we, do, we also do a lot of work with more specific battles out in western New York where it is, we could, where the Mohawk and the uh, Iroquois are allied with the British and the Oneida are with the Continentals, but that's a little bit later and well, it kind of it starts about this time, but it's out in the Mohawk Valley more than here where that div kind of divide starts up. Uh, for Burgoyne, he gets a, kind of a lot of the Canadian tribes, like yeah. the Huron maybe and stuff, but it's, they kind didn't like, really, yeah, yeah, so they didn't have a really good listing of who's mm -hmm. allied with him. And a lot of that too, it's, it gets really confused because some people within a tribe would ally with one versus the other. So like the Delaware, um, if you look out west, New York, you had some that were fighting with the British, but they also have some that are fighting with the Continentals and serving as scouts. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, and there's even cases of like Oneida killing Oneida uh, because it just became a real civil war and almost, uh, it, it's hard to, there were some tribes that identified kind of with, generally with the British or with the Continentals, but it gets real fuzzy on who's who. Or, uh, the Bennington stuff, I haven't looked too closely at Bennington, so you probably know <laughs> about that more of that. But, um, but as far as Skyler too, I mean, he gets kind of roped in the kind of politics with Continental Congress, so he gets removed mm -hmm. um, from his leadership role in the Northern Department, replaced by Horatio Gates. Mm -hmm. A lot of that's kind of tied into politics between New England and New York um, and they also see him his kind of his Dutch background they don't like that the, the New England Continental Congress don't like that and they use that as an excuse there's even some accusation that he's a Tory but I don't think those are <laughs> grounded at all um, 
So I think that was just a, an excuse to get rid of him. So he's kind of, that's also kind of a transition period. Okay. Of so when was he's, it true that he said, don't defend Bennington, you know? He yeah. might have been out or no, leaving no. by that okay. time. No, that's not true. Okay. Yeah. It's just one of the stories I've heard, so I wanted to <coughs> yeah. you know, sort it out. <laughs> okay. If you hold your seats, we have a couple of comments, and I think Phyllis wants to make a little presentation. Very fascinating things. I know everyone has a lot of information that they would like to uh, glean from Mike here today. And we do thank you so much for coming and hope that you will enjoy oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Willard's book about Ethan Allen. And uh, Willard was on our board until recently when he's off doing other things, being a very busy person, as we all. So again, I want to welcome everybody here. Thank you so much for coming and supporting our lecture theory series. And if you have any ideas about anyone you would like to see, like I don't know where John gets all his wonderful people <laughs> that he brings in, but he finds them. And so lots of times it's someone who has been somewhere and hears somebody or hears about something that would be of interest to us in this area. Just let yeah. John Devon know. Judging from the question, there's some people probably right in this room who could also give a good talk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we have had some of them here, yes. So thank you. Uh, we don't do a talk in December, so our next talk will be the third Sunday in January, I think it's maybe the 21st, and the speaker is Robert Duchamp, who I believe, I believe he's standing to my left, we only met maybe a few minutes before the talk, but Robert, is that you over here? No, you're not Robert. Robert and the, Dan O'Neill said Robert was here, okay, so Robert, do you want it without giving your whole spiel, you want to just tell us what your topic might be uh, for our next talk. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be uh, speaking about uh, the role of my sixth great grandfather, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Knight of the Rhode Island Militia, and his role in the American Revolution. So although the uh, talk will feature the uh, revolution in the uh, Southern New England <laughs> theater of uh, operations, uh, really it's going to focus overall on the role that the uh, New England militia played overall. So looking forward to seeing most of you there. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And lastly, Friday is uh, Black Friday, right? So many of you are going to be out at Walmart at 4 a.m. <laughs> uh, I like to think that today is Red, White, and Blue Sunday. You might consider stopping by our table and checking out our books, our mugs, and maybe picking up a Christmas present, an early present for someone in your family. Looking around the room, unfortunately, our speaker is probably the youngest person in the room, along with our camera operator. And we do have some young children's books out there. There are about four or five titles of those that you might want to take a look at. We have Will Randall's biography of Ethan, and also uh, the new book, uh, Unshackling America, is also out there. So again, thank you for coming. Enjoy your Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.